Good morning. The first item of business this morning is general questions. And we start with question number one from Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Lothian regarding plans to rebuild the Edinburgh Cancer Centre. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government and NHS Lothian have been in regular contact to discuss NHS Lothian's plans to rebuild the Edinburgh Cancer Centre. A site visit was arranged for Scottish Government officials in September 2016 and NHS Lothian recently submitted their strategic assessment of the proposed development to the NHS Capital Investment Group. NHS Lothian are in the process of developing the initial agreement, the main purpose of which is to confirm the need for the investment. Colin Smith. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that, that patients from my own region, in particular Dumfries and Galloway, often have to travel to the Western General for cancer treatment and are provided with outpatient accommodation at Pentland Lodge next to the, the cancer unit, accommodation currently under review by the Health Board. Now, this accommodation means patients don't have the gruelling journey back and forth from Dumfries and Galloway and they get invaluable peer support that you simply wouldn't receive staying in a nearby hotel. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore give assurances that in any service changes at the hospital, an outpatient's residential facility will be retained and that current and past patients, including those from Dumfries and Galloway, will be fully involved in any discussions around any service changes? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, uh, can I say to the member that I very much do appreciate, um, given the circumstances of, of the treatment that patients are undergoing, the need for appropriate uh, accommodation. Uh, the decisions on that level of detail haven't been finalised at, at this point, as the member uh, will be aware. But I can assure the member that the needs of patients travelling from across Scotland, including Dumfries and Galloway, will be considered as the business case develops. I've asked specifically to be uh, kept informed uh, around the issue of Pentland Lodge. I do believe it's important that appropriate accommodation <coughs> is provided and I'm happy to liaise with the member uh, as this issue is taken forward. I think we should though bear in mind that the potential here is for a uh, uh, a fit-for-purpose oncology uh, assessment unit, uh, a state-of-the-art uh, facility, um, and we should keep that in mind. But it is important that patients who are travelling from out with the Edinburgh area, area get the appropriate accommodation, and I'm happy to keep in contact with the member about that. And Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it's my understanding that NHS Lothian have submitted an initial agreement proposal um, to make the case for some interim bridging capital to upgrade the existing accommodation before a new centre is built. Has the Minister decided, to, has the Cabinet Secretary su decided to support this appeal for bridging capital? And will she meet with me, NHS Lothian, and other MSPs whose constituents use the centre to discuss how we're taking forward proposals for a new centre? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member will be uh, aware of the various stages involved in a decision uh, on the funding. I'm happy to meet with the member and NHS Lothian to talk about the specifics that Miles Briggs uh, raises. Obviously, the business case that I, I was referring to um, is at an early stage. Uh, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to make any uh, decision before the review of the business case uh, is uh, completed. Uh, and obviously any uh, other investments in and around this decision would need to be seen in the context of that bigger project. But I'm happy to meet with Miles Briggs and uh, NHS Lothian to discuss that further. Question number two, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to tackle Islamophobia. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, we have invested over half a million pounds in 2016-17 to promote interfaith relations and engagement between Civic Scotland and different faith communities. We are also developing an ambitious programme of work following the report of the Independent Advisory Group on Hate Crime, Prejudice and Community Cohesion, including running a hate crime awareness raising campaign this year. And in January, the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs announced an independent review of hate crime legislation. Angus MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary for a reply, and I'm pleased to hear that of the progress being made. However, the fact remains that Islamophobia continues in my Falkirk East constituency and beyond. It's been suggested to me by, by groups who have been at the receiving end of Islamophobia in Falkirk District that a relaunch of the One Scotland Many Cultures campaign would help show Scotland as a diverse, multi-faith and multicultural society it is, committed to promoting One Scotland where many cultures can thrive side by side. Will the Cabinet Secretary give that some consideration? 
Uh, yes, absolutely, presiding officer. Uh, as alluded to in my original answer, we are currently developing an awareness raising campaign uh, around the impact of hate crime as part uh, of our One Scotland campaign. Uh, the One Scotland campaign continues uh, just now to have uh, an online presence, but we'll look at how uh, we can develop that further. And this uh, was one of the, the very important recommendations uh, coming from the independent advisory group on uh, hate crime prejudice and community cohesion um, recommendations around public education uh, and how we can promote uh, a clearer understanding of what hate crime actually is, uh, the impact of it, and to really get across that strong message that it mustn't be tolerated and it must uh, be reported uh, at every opportunity. And I hope that gives some reassurance to the member and to Chamber. Anastar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Despite the government's efforts, Islamophobic hate crimes actually doubled in the last year in Scotland. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what specific measures will be taken to help support Muslim communities to better report Islamophobic hate crime, how we can set examples of people being convicted for Islamophobic hate crime, and also thirdly, if the government shares any data about Islamophobic hate crime with any organisations that monitor the trends in Islamophobia. I thank Mr Sarwar for his question. He is absolutely uh, right to point to an increase in Islamophobia in terms of crimes reported. And if we look at the most recent uh, hate crime statistics published by the, the Crown Office and uh, Procurator Fiscal Service, we will see a, an increase in the number of charges uh, where conduct was derogatory uh, to Islam, rising from 71 uh, to 134. And we know that this isn't attributable to a single event or pattern, but is uh, due to uh, a general rise uh, in reporting and it is important uh, that while any crime is indeed regrettable it's important uh, that crime is uh, reported uh, so that a firm stance uh, can be can be taken in terms of uh, third party uh, reporting there was a review uh, that has been undertaken in terms of the effectiveness of that that was one of the very important uh, recommendations uh, from the independent advisory uh, report there was also recommendations that we're currently working through in terms of data because uh, good, uh, robust uh, but data that gives a more granular detail uh, to the causes uh, and conditions in which uh, this crime it flourishes it is very important and I would also hope uh, my final point presiding officer is that maybe of some reassurance uh, to Mr uh, Sarwar that we will come forward uh, with a plan of action in the very near future but as part of our determination to tackle prejudice in all its forms we have introduced three-year funding uh, for the equality budget uh, so that will support uh, the very important work undertaken by uh, you know diverse groups uh, and groups that are working in our communities to tackle hate, crime and prejudice in all its forms. Question number three, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the recent Galloway Council regarding engagement with local communities on proposed regeneration plans for the White Sands in Dumfries. Minister Kevin Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we've had no discussion with the Council on this issue. Uh, councils are independent organisations accountable to their own electorate and it is for them to determine how to conduct appropriate consultation and engagement for particular projects. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for that answer but with the projected costs for the combined flood defence and regeneration scheme spiralling, spiralling upwards, local businesses in the town are growing increasingly angry at the arrogance of Dumfries and Galloway Council who, who they believe have failed to properly engage with the wider community on the regeneration aspects of the scheme, ignoring legitimate concerns in order to railroad through their own deeply unpopular proposals under the guise of flood defences. Given the widespread concern, will the Minister commit to meeting with worried businesses in the town? And, hand, and can he clarify that all Scottish Government funding for the project will be going towards flood prevention, not ill-thought-out landscape gardening and streetscaping? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I appreciate that there is opposition uh, to the flood protection scheme being proposed by Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and I'm aware that Mr Mundell uh, has talked about this previously and Joan McAlpine uh, has written to me on this issue uh, also. Um, but the key thing in all of this is the responsibility of Dumfries and Galloway uh, Council in this regard. Um, 
There is a, a statutory process which uh, must be undertaken uh, before a proposed flood protection scheme can be confirmed. Uh, and this provides an opportunity for objections uh, to the proposed scheme to be lodged uh, and the local authority is obliged to seek to address these objections. Uh, I understand that the Council started this statutory process on the 1st of February uh, and the consultation period closes in the, on the 1st of March. Um, and I would urge uh, those folks who uh, are unhappy with the scheme to respond to that consultation. If there are still objections which cannot be resolved, then the scheme has to be referred to ministers who will decide whether to call in the proposals for their consideration. Uh, this is the only stage uh, of the process where the Scottish Government actually plays a direct role. Uh, and I would urge Mr Mundell to continue to engage with Dumfries and Galloway Council uh, on this issue. Question number four, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the Scottish Growth Scheme. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government is continuing to progress its work with partners on the development and delivery of the new Scottish Growth Scheme that will provide up to £500 million over three years of investment guarantees and some loans. The work is progressing to deliver the most effective scheme possible. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The £500 million growth scheme was described in the SNP's programme for government as a scheme to provide up to £500 million of investment guarantees and loans, as the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed. I understand that funding for this scheme will be demand-led, but if there is any likely likelihood of any loans being made in the next financial year, there should be funding allocated in the budget. Given this, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, where in the budget can we find the additional funding for any loans to be made under the growth scheme? Is the funding within the enterprise budget or is, no, is there no funding at all available for this scheme? Cabinet Secretary. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear all that the member said uh, because some of the noise in the chamber, but I think he was asking the question about whether some of the funding which might be available through the growth scheme will also be available or should be instead be available in the budget. But the budget, as has been set out by uh, my colleague uh, Derek Mackay, has within it, uh, and including the allocations to enterprise agencies, the ability to make grants and funds and uh, loans available nece if necessary to businesses. This is additional £500 million. It's, it is demand-led, as the member has said, and some of the work that we're currently doing is trying to make sure we have an exact fix on where the demand is most likely to come from and that we can meet that demand. But this is a response to the situation that we find ourselves in when we've had Brexit coming through. We've got a UK government that is refusing to attach a high priority to some of the most important important sectors in Scotland and this is a positive response to do that and I thought for that reason you'd get some mention of support or welcome from the Conservative benches for a very important measure to help businesses across Scotland. Jackie Bailey. With Scotland lagging behind the rest of the UK on a number of economic indicators, can the SAP Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber how many jobs he expects the scheme to create and the level of growth it will add to our currently fragile economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, that will entirely depend on the nature of the applications which come forward and the loans that we're able to make, including uh, the investment guarantees that we can uh, make. Now, uh, Jackie Bailey mentions that we're lagging the UK behind some measures. We're also in advance of the UK in many measures, which he does not mention uh, at all in this chamber. But it's as well to acknowledge that fact, you know, in terms of uh, uh, females in employment, for example, or in youth um, employment as well. So. It is the case that this growth scheme is designed to ensure that we do increase job opportunities, that we allow companies currently which are struggling for finance to, to grow, to provide more employment opportunities and to add growth in the Scottish economy. So that's the purpose of the scheme. And once again, it would be useful to say, at least in relation to the principle of the scheme, that the Labour Party support this. Question number five, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure there is access to local specialist care services across the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. NHS boards are responsible for planning and delivering healthcare services to meet the assessed needs of their resident populations, taking into account strategic frameworks and guidance within the allocations provided. Donald Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the plight of Ockin Lee Care Home in Campbelltown, which is under threat of closure. She may also know that last week the local IJB and the operator agreed to ensure Ockin Lee stays open for one more year. However, local people remain concerned that their loved ones may have to seek alternative support out with our Garland Butte if a long-term solution can't be identified. So what assurances can she give people in the remoter parts of the Highlands and Islands that this type of care provision will continue to exist, given that suitable local alternatives are often not available? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am aware that, uh, that many uh, members, including uh, uh, Mike Russell and uh, others, have been involved in uh, trying to ensure that the, uh, the capacity of local uh, care facilities is, is maintained. And obviously, the, a lot of work has been gone on with the, the local health and care partnership to ensure that is the case. Uh, I am uh, aware of some of the challenges in remote and rural Scotland in ensuring that the right uh, care provision is provided. Some of that may well be within uh, care home establishments, but that has to obviously be uh, fit for purpose. Uh, but also some community-based uh, um, facilities as well. And I'm aware within Highland there's been some very innovative, innovative solutions uh, brought into local communities uh, that have involved uh, building capacity within the community uh, for those requiring uh, uh, care uh, support. Uh, I am happy to uh, keep in contact with Donald Cameron about this issue. Clearly, we would expect the local health and care partnerships to take these matters forward. However, my own officials have been very involved in this local matter, as I'm sure Donald Cameron uh, is aware of, and I'm very content for them to continue uh, to be so, to make sure that we get the best solution for local people. Question number six, Joanne Lamond. <coughs> Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met groups representing survivors of child sexual abuse and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, I met with a number of survivors and their representatives on the 9th of November 2016. Discussions included the remit of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, the Inquiry Panel membership, redress and the Limitation Bill. Scottish Government officials also <laughs> attended the quarterly meeting of the Interaction Plan Review Group on the 19th of December 2016. This group reviews progress against the action plan and topics included in the in-care survivor support fund, the forthcoming consultation and engagement on financial redress, the survivor representation in the group and future governance arrangements for the group. A meeting has been requested with me by Wellbeing Scotland, which was formerly known as Open Secret and other survivors. Scottish Government officials have been in contact with Wellbeing Scotland with suggested dates, and I hope to meet with them at some point next month. Joanne Lamond. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that, that answer, and I welcome his commitment to meet with Wellbeing Scotland. The Deputy First Minister will be aware of the ongoing concerns of survivors of child sexual abuse about the progress of the inquiry into the abuse of children and young people in care. There are concerns that none of the original panel now remain in position and that the survivors, support for survivors in the process is excluding those with proven expertise and understanding and the experience of survivors. How will the, Cabinet, the Deputy First Minister address these concerns, sustain confidence in the inquiry and ensure that while the inquiry is independent of government, it acts in the context of an approach shaped by the survivors who understand best the impact of abuse and understand best what support they need? Cabinet Secretary. First of all, Presiding Officer, can I acknowledge the long-standing interest of Joanne Lamont on these issues and the, uh, the, the seriousness with which she raises the, question, the important questions with me today. In connection with the, uh, the, the membership of the uh, Child Abuse Inquiry panel, um, I obviously understand that survivors find this uh, unsettling, that there has been a further change this week. And I've explained that that has arisen because one of the members of the panel, the last remaining member of the original panel, um, has had a change of employment circumstances and in discussion with Lady Smith has resolved that some of the implications of his new employment may give rise to potential conflicts of interest and has acted to resolve those at this stage. I assure Joanne Lamont, uh, Parliament and survivors, that the appointment of Lady Smith to lead the inquiry was a decision taken by me after consultation with survivors to try to build that confidence that I acknowledge to be so essential to the duration of the inquiry. I can also reassure Parliament that the inquiry is uh, gathering a significant amount of evidence and on the 8th of February Lady Smith made clear that there were now 69 institutions that were the subject of her inquiries as a consequence of evidence coming to her from survivors. I can encourage survivors to come forward with that evidence to the inquiry. Uh, there are, of course, other mechanisms of survivor support that are available through the, um, the, in the mechanisms that I announced already. And I am pursuing discussions about redress with survivors groups to make sure that that, as the other principal outstanding issue, is addressed satisfactorily. 
And I give Joanne Lamont and Parliament the assurance that the Government is absolutely committed to ensuring that the inquiry has the resources and the capacity to address the remit that has been designed for it and to bring justice and accountability in an area where justice and accountability should have been delivered.